Right then, hello. Um, I'm back with the second part. Right, we've just had um, Macbeth has arrived, or here he is, enter Macbeth with bloody daggers, to which she replies, my husband. Really interesting little quotation to ex to explore. How does she say that? Does she say that proudly? Is she frightened she, in, in the way that she says that? Um, you know, there's a there's a really a lovely little quote that you could talk about to show lots of different interpretations of the same idea. Right, we'll whisk through. Macbeth, I've done the deed. Did thou not hear a noise? I've done it. Again, how you decide. How does he say that? Is he proud? Is he um, celebrating? Or is he terrified? Or somewhere in between? Is he bitter? Is he angry? Is he looking at it? How is he saying it? And how is he showing this to an audience? That's the great thing about drama is that you've got so much that you can say that you can just decide yourself. Okay? Um, Lady Macbeth, I heard the owl scream and the crickets cry. Did not you speak? Didn't you say something? When? Lady Macbeth, go to the next section. Uh, now, as I descended, yet yeah, I... Hark, who lies in the second chamber? Look at the line lengths there. Right, we're talking about how uh, Lady Macbeth and Macbeth are presented. Suddenly, they go to really short line lengths. So they, often, um, that's suggested by directors, or that's suggested um, about, by people who are writing about Macbeth, or thinking about Macbeth, that that suggests tension, that they're really uh, nervous, and that comes across in these short line lengths. Perhaps that's something you could argue if you wanted to. Right, he asks, who lies in the second chamber, in the second bedroom, not the one where the king was in the other one? Lady Macbeth replies, Donald Bain, that's the king's son. Macbeth looks at his hands, classic stuff this now, guys, classic line, this is a sorry sight. Now obviously suggesting there, he's looking at the blood on his hands, really dramatic, this is a sorry sight. Lots of people use that as a quotation, it's a good one. How is he saying that? Is he saying that angrily to Lady Macbeth? Is it suggesting that he's saying to Lady Macbeth, look what you made me do? Or is he saying it quietly to himself? Um, <coughs> is he shouting it? How? What are we learning about Macbeth's character from this line? And as I say, the beauty is that you can decide. There's no right or wrong answer here. Okay, so you're free to just suggest how that might be acted or how that might be said. Okay. Um, Lady Macbeth replies, a foolish thought to say a sorry sight. Again, how does she say that? Is she angry with him? Does she snap that out? Or is she trying to comfort him? Um, you know, is she scared herself? The two versions we've got on Charles and I will show you two different reactions to that. Um, right, Macbeth then goes on. He goes to talk in this bit about when he was about to, when he was got, wanted to do the murder, in the other chamber, he heard the two people there, Donald Bain and Malcolm, um, uh, Duncan's two sons, they woke up, not necessarily because of him, but they woke up, one of them um, laughed in his sleep, the other one cried murder, um, and they woke themselves up, basically. Uh, Macbeth stood and heard them, very tense moment, you can imagine, we don't see it, but you can imagine it being tense, but they did say their prayers and address them again to sleep. So he just, he tells what happened, he's telling them what happened. He went and heard them, um, they woke up, they said their prayers and they went back to sleep. Um, this, I suppose, is a bit I'll draw your attention to. He says, listening their fear, I could not say amen when they did say God bless us. So when he heard these two chaps, the two sons, say their prayers and say and, and say God bless us, um, in Shakespeare's day, the right thing to do then would be to, for him very quietly, obviously he's not going to shout it out, he doesn't want to get caught, but to very quietly whisper amen. Right, that's what you would do if you heard a prayer. That's what you're expected to do. And he couldn't do it. He could not say amen. And obviously this is worrying him. Okay, so how is he delivering these lines? What does that mean? What does that show about Macbeth? Does it show his regret um, about what he's done, possibly? Lady Macbeth replies, consider it not so deeply. Don't think about it so much. So you get a translation here. Don't worry about it. Interesting here, I think, that she's kind of telling him what to do and what to think. And of course, in Shakespeare's day, it wouldn't really be the, the woman's role to, to order the husband around to tell him what to do. Macbeth goes on, but wherefore could I not pronounce Amen? Why? Why couldn't I say Amen? It doesn't mean where, it means why. I had most need of blessing and Amen stuck in my throat. He, he was just about to do something, something terrible. He needed the support of God and Amen stuck in his throat. Lady Macbeth, these deeds must not be thought. Again, a little bit ordery maybe, ordering her husband around. 
Uh, these, these, these must not be thought after these ways, so it will make us mad. Now, interesting point there is, of course, that she then does go mad. Perhaps a little bit of foreshadowing from Shakespeare. Later on in the play, she does go mad. And also, you've got all the thing about the hands. Do you remember? She, when she does go mad, she rubs her hands together a lot uh, and can't get the blood off her hands. Um, so, as we looked at with Mice and Men, maybe a bit of foreshadowing there. Shakespeare preparing us for what's going to happen. Okay, we're on page three of four. The last sort of big bit, really, carrying on their conversation. Um, Macbeth ends really goes off on one. We thought I heard a voice cry, sleep no more. Macbeth does murder sleep. The innocent sleep, sleep that knits up the raveled sleeve of care, the death of each day's life, sore labour's bath, balm of hurt minds, great natures, second course, chief nourisher in life's feast. Uh, feast excuse me. What you've got there, you've got loads of imagery where Macbeth is talking about sleep. And he's imagined, or we assume he has, um, that he's heard this voice say, Macbeth has murdered sleep. Again, he goes into this very poetic language, saw labour's bath, talking about sleep, being, the, being like a bath at the end of a, a tired day. Um, it relieves the weary labourers, what you've got there. Um, heals hurt minds. Um, and Macbeth's murdered it. Now, why has he suddenly started using this very poetic language? What does it show about Macbeth's state of mind? Okay, um, that's something for you to think about. He suddenly goes off. Why do people use poetic language, often at times of sort of emotional stress or trauma and things like that? You know, if you get um, dumped by your girlfriend or, or war, things like that. Okay, people talking poetically, don't they? So what's Shakespeare trying to show us about Macbeth's state of mind there? Something that you could perhaps think about in your response. Okay. Um, Lady Macbeth, what do you mean? Now, really interesting. How is she responding to him here? Is she saying that in a reassuring way? Like, what do you mean, my darling? Or is she, like, is she cross with him? How angry is she? Remember, if he goes mad... If he can't handle the guilt of what he's done, she's in for the chop as well, isn't she? She needs to protect herself here. So how ruthless, how sort of strong would you like Lady Macbeth to be at this point when she's saying these lines? Okay, something for you to think about and write in your essay. Okay, Macbeth, still it cried sleep no more. Glams has murdered sleep and therefore Cordo shall sleep no more. Macbeth shall sleep no more. This is still talking about this, this voice that he's heard in his head. Lady Macbeth takes over here. For me, and this doesn't have to be for you, but this is the moment where she really starts to get cross with him. She really starts to panic a bit and lose it with him. She says, or, or does she panic? I don't know. She kind of tries to regain control. Who was it that thus cried? Who said that? Nobody said that is her implication. You're making it up. Why, worthy thing? Why, my worthy lord? You do unbend your noble strength to think so brain sickly of things. Um, it's sort of, you should be... You're not being strong. You're supposed to be strong as the man, as a noble lord, and you're, this unbending your noble strength means sort of suggesting that you're making yourself weak. A bit like she did before when he was having doubts about committing the murder. So she's trying that tactic again. Go get some water, wash this filthy witness from your hand, get the blood off your hand, get the evidence off your hands, and then she notices. Or did she see it before? It's up to you. Why did you bring the daggers from this place? They must lie there. Go carry them and smear the sleepy grooms, the, the guards with blood. So she tells them to take the daggers back, put blood on the on the grooms' faces. This is interesting, isn't it? Macbeth just refuses. In the past, when she said he was a coward, um, when he was, didn't want to kill the king in the first place, she sort of called him a coward, and that seemed to do the trick. He seemed to uh, kind of come round to her way of thinking. He didn't like being called a coward by his wife, and, and he thought, maybe you're right, maybe I need to be braver. Here, he flatly admits that he's too frightened to go back. I'll go no more. I'm afraid to think what I've done. Look on it again. I dare not. I dare not go back to the place. Quite unusual for a brave male character like Macbeth to admit freely to his wife that he is too scared. Interesting. Right, Lady Macbeth, infirm of purpose. That's the first time she really actually kind of insults him. She says he's infirm of purpose. A bit like calling him a coward. A bit like saying... You know, um, he's infirm, he's not strong, he's weak. Give me the daggers, she decides to do it. The sleeping and the dead are but as pictures. So dead and sleeping people can't hurt you, they're just like pictures. Tis the eye of childhood that fears a painted devil. Here she, he calls, 
she's implying that he's a child there. So in your, what's this showing about Lady Macbeth? What's this showing about Macbeth? Um, you know, what's it showing about her character? And how would you have her say these lines on stage? If he do bleed, I'll gild the face of the grooms with all, for it must seem their guilt. So she takes over here now. And she starts saying, right, if the king's bleeding, which he will be, I'll get the blood, put it on the faces of the servants, and make it seem like they did the murder. You could easily argue with this quote that Lady Macbeth is, is really brutal, really ruthless, really strong, vicious, uh, but also kind of clever, isn't she? She thinks ahead. She Even in this high-stress situation, Macbeth has gone off on one and started reading poetry, basically, or making up poetry. Lady Macbeth's really clear about what she wants, isn't it? And she plans for the for the next stage. So what I'm going to do now is I'll, I'll stop at this stage. There's one more page to go. I'll do that on the next film, um, which you should watch now.